Welcome to another episode of Not Quite Strangers. My name is Valerie Hope. I'm a speaker. I'm a leadership coach and also a podcaster. And this is my show and an opportunity for me to bring two people who are not quite strangers, in this case, are complete strangers <laughs> together to have a meaningful conversation. And my mission is to make sure that we inspire curiosity, that this builds connection, and really start to disrupt how people who don't know each other connect and interact. So we're gonna see it today right here. Uh, I would hope that as you are watching and listening to this podcast, if anything resonates with you, please leave it in the comments. Let us know, rate the show, favorite us, because there's lots of cool conversations coming up. And I'm so excited about today because I have here in my presence two very interesting gentlemen. I'm going to start off with uh, Prashant. Prashant, you and I go way back to like maybe August <laughs> of 2021. <laughs> So not too long ago, but you and I worked together because I am your coach <laughs> and I've had some fantastic conversations. And one of the things I really appreciate about you, Prashant, is that you have shared, obviously, I will not be revealing anything <laughs> from our sessions because it's confidential. So you can reveal anything you like. But one of the things I really admire about you is how committed you are to your own well-being. And, and focusing on not only your well-being, but also how to share that information with other people. And when I heard that in one of our sessions, I thought, oh my gosh, I need to have Prashant come to the podcast and talk to somebody. Who? That's the question. Who will I have Prashant talk to? And ta-da-da-da, -ta I have my dear friend Skip. And Skip, you and I go back a couple years now, I think, um, and we know each other from Toastmasters. And for you, I think the thing that really drew me in for you is that you have, uh, first of all, a really fantastic story. You, I, I interviewed you on my first podcast, Time to Come Alive. So if anybody wants the background on Skip, there's more rich detail there. But I think what really stood out to me at this point in time is, uh, Skip, your commitment to also helping men break through some of the fear of being vulnerable and sharing when they need help. And when you said that, and I, I think you mentioned it in a speech and a book that you wrote, I was like, oh my gosh, you and Prashant would be a great match for Not Quite Strangers. So ta-da, welcome to the show. Thank you, Valerie. <laughs> Thanks, Valerie. Great to be on the, on the show. Yay. Now I'm going to put you guys on the spot as I do every single guest. Why did you say yes to being on a podcast <laughs> for the whole world to see you meet a complete stranger? It was easy for me. This was the first time I was invited for a podcast. So hard to say no. Uh, <laughs> but more importantly, I was very curious as to how mm. this conversation will go. Uh, I have never met Skip before. So I'm really, really curious to see how this goes. Hey, all right. So curiosity. Good. Thank you, Prashant. And Skip, what about for you? Several reasons, Valerie. One, you're so much fun. <laughs> You're, you're a very bright, articulate uh, woman that brings such uh, insight into things. Also, you have a way of connecting people on many levels. And, that, and that's one thing that I uh, appreciate about you because you do that in Toastmasters. You do that outside of Toastmasters. You do that in the business world. So you, you do that on, on many levels. So I have a, a great deal of respect for you the way you are able to do that um, in many ways in your life, both personally and professionally. The other is you gave me some feedback on my recent uh, preparations for my TEDx talk mm -hmm. that I delivered back last month in Vancouver, uh, Canada, that I was preparing for, and you were gracious enough to Zoom with me one evening, <laughs> as it was. It was late for you because that time difference. I was on the West Coast, and so you very graciously Zoomed and gave me some important feedback. So you've been generous with your time with me. And oh, you own me. Oh, yeah, sure. 
<laughs> the law of reciprocity. I'm it my my there you go. But, <laughs> but no, I, I enjoy time with you. Every time I, I've got to spend time with you, it's been a delight. So how, how could uh, I say no? Oh, thank you so much. Wonderful, beautiful words, Skip. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, there's no such thing as you didn't owe me anything. I was happy to support you. And we'll make sure to share the link when you're, you have your TEDx talk come out. So that way, thank you. you. Everybody I appreciate can see that. It. Yeah, I think that would be so cool. So speaking of that, uh, I mentioned that thin line that I thought, oh my gosh, this is a great connection for the two of you. I, I don't, I'm trying to think back to any of the other podcasts I've done where two men come together. Well, you know, not quite strangers is relatively new, but I think having the idea of having two men share their struggles, their challenges, their goals, their resources on focusing on well being was so important. I have three brothers. I'm the only girl. And my brothers don't always tell me stuff. <laughs> I can tell you right now. I pull some things out of them, but they. <laughs> They are very adept at not sharing things. My mom will often call and say, have you talked to your brother? What's he doing? How's he doing? I'm like, he doesn't say anything to me either. And so, um, I think I'm going to be learning a lot here. And, and I really do want to, not because you know there's anything specific going on, but I do want to make sure that I connect to the men in my life in ways that are supportive. And that's the other piece that I also thought would be interesting for me. So... Uh, let's start with Prashant. I, I want you to share as much as you're comfortable sharing about what are your experiences so far and just managing your own well-being. What, why was that even important to you? Sure. So I've been in a leadership role for more than a decade. The main thing as a leader that I need to do is make sure I'm healthy so that I can take care of others in, or support others in their journey. It's almost like an oxygen mask in an airplane. You need to put it on first before you try to put it on others. So to be a good leader, uh, that has been a driving force that has forced me to take care of myself in a better way. Mm. I've not been successful at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's important, but it's hard. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have reached stages. I am uh, fairly game to share my journey where I did go into a burnout phase and how I tried to come out of it is, is something of a continuous learning experience. Mm, interesting. Well, I just, I want to dig in a little bit here, Prashant. First of all, how, how many people have you shared this with and what's been their reaction? So the latest burnout episode, which happened about- Latest, there's been more? Uh, the one, the first one was maybe about 10 years ago. Uh, oh. It's way past uh, in, the, in the history. Uh, the latest one was in the last quarter of uh, 2021. Mm. I shared my story with you because you are my coach. Uh, the support that I got helped me share my story with my entire team. Uh, mm. I shared it with my directs and the extended organization. The surprising thing was, it wasn't that people felt sympathy. It was more that many people came back and said, yes, they are going through this or they have gone through this, mm -hmm. but they never brought that up with their wow. support system, whether it's their manager or their family, which was sort of eye opener that this, this topic needs to be talked about. People need to feel comfortable bringing this up and taking care of themselves. Oh, that's huge. I'm so glad that you did that. That was, first of all, it's bold, right? It's bold to, to, to share. Um, I want to hear, Skip, what are your reactions to that? And I also want to hear what, uh, what, what brought you into this space of helping men become, you know, take care of themselves. Well, I think many of us who are highly driven and have been in leadership have, have experienced that burnout because I've experienced it at different points in my career, unfortunately didn't share with anybody, struggled through it yeah. and, and was miserable uh, in, in that process. But I think when you come out and you openly share these things, you are giving permission to others to now admit, I'm likewise struggling. I can use, I, I need help. 
and you give them permission to seek help. And particularly when we're talking about mental health issues in men, in, in short, I, I consider myself a tough guy. And now I call myself a transformed tough guy. <laughs> so what do I mean by a tough guy? Okay, I, I've been involved with the sport of wrestling since I was a young teenager. So over 50 years, I've been involved in the sport of wrestling at, at many levels as a competitor, as a coach, a, as a father of wrestlers, a brother of wrestlers, mm -hmm. um, and, and as a competitor, again, at the age of 56, where I competed and won a national veterans wrestling Whoa, championship. Oh, that's why you were. <laughs> I wasn't that's why I was pulling out my, my <laughs> national plaque. So I won the national veterans uh, championship. Nice. So, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, wrestling's in my blood. Okay. Yeah. In fact, my kids would affectionately call me a wrestling groupie because <laughs> I'm the kind of guy that not just goes to matches and tournaments and these events, but I go up to these wrestling greats, Olympians, uh, world medalists, et cetera, national champions. And I am asking for a picture. I'm asking them to sign my wrestling cards. You've heard of baseball cards and those kind of cards. Well, I have my wrestling cards. I have my wrestling posters. I have my wrestling books. I look to their page and would you sign this for me? And I'm getting a photo with wow. them that I'm You're friends committed. with some of these uh, Olympic champions and world champions <laughs> and so forth. And, and so uh, this is, you know, what I do with these, but see, so wrestling, uh, do you know the rock? 26 years. I don't know the rock. That's okay. If that's, you connect with the rock, then bring me. All in, right. Okay? All right. I got to work on that. <laughs> now you owe me again. All right. <laughs> all right. Lady. I'll work on that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Wrestling. All right. <laughs> medicine, you know, Colonel deployed for three and a half years uh, during the course of my career, over 18 months in combat zones. Uh, uh, there. So I'm a tough guy, but I became a casualty of depression my last year in the army. And as I began to recover, I received a calling to help other men struggling from depression. I didn't know how I was going to carry that out, but I knew I was going to share my story. Mm -hmm. And the first time I shared that openly was with the staff. So you talked about sharing it with your team and your organization. I shared it with the staff at Eisenhower Army Medical Center. So the commander, I, the command and my staff, they knew there because I had shared with them as I was receiving treatment. And I said, I would like to tell my story and the lessons I've learned along. He gave me carte blanche. I said, okay, Skip, there on officer development day. So we had a monthly program. You have the stage. And so a morning and afternoon session. And I talked about my story and the lessons I was learning along the way with the intent of dealing uh, with the topic of stigma related to mental illness. Uh, and encouraging those who are struggling to get help. And here's the things that helped me. So here I am, a colonel, well-known in the hospital, department chief, like I said, had been deployed. Um, a, a lot of things there that gave me this, this platform to, with which to speak from, but with the idea that others need to hear this story. And afterwards, people came up and likewise said, you know, I've struggled there too, or I am struggling, or this person in my life, they're struggling. So when we share, I think especially as men, we give others permission to share. That's beautiful. That's so true. I think it's, it's true for everyone. When we open ourselves up, it also gives other people permission. I, I want to take a step back because both of you have shared with people, once you've kind of identified here's what's going on, here's what I'm going to do about it, right? You had your strategy and your plan in place. But how, what do you do when you're in it? When you're, when you're thinking whatever thoughts you're thinking, when you're feeling that overwhelm or that, that depression, like how do you deal with that? Who do you go to then? How does, even, how does one know to even go to somebody? <laughs> like, let's go basic. Like if there's somebody listening right now or someone who knows someone that's been experiencing some things, like how, where do they even start? Oh, that's a great question. Would you like to go first, uh, Prashad? Sure. Uh, I think the hardest thing is diagnosing it yourself. I think the 
telltale sign is change in behavior. The behavior does degrade as your uh, internal makeup uh, is is not happy or or is not excited. Hmm. Having close friends, either at work or outside of work, who can be very open uh, and hold the mirror to you when your behavior mm. changes, uh, really, really helps. All right, I'm going to take a time out because I know it's really easy, and I know both of you really well, so I'm comfortable doing this. That we don't use you. I'd like for you to tell us your story. So, what did you do? Who did you talk to? What? Who held the mirror up to you? What did they say that held the mirror up? Like. So using the word I instead of you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> for me, there were physical symptoms. So I had daily fevers that started to show up in the evening. And I had a deep sense of dissatisfaction. Even after working eight, 10 hours of day, it always felt empty. Mm. Then I shared these things with my manager at that time, I shared it uh, with, with you, Valerie, since you were my coach. Uh, and luckily, I just had good people to talk to. Uh, so mm-hmm. my manager provided, uh, he used the burnout word first. And that's when mm-hmm. it uh, sort of became very evident that maybe I'm lying to myself that I can, I think I can breeze through this. Mm. If I keep pushing, I'll get through this. But then once he called it out, it became very yeah. evident. Oh. What did you think it was? If, before he said the word burnout, what, what did you think was happening? I thought it was uh, more of a phase that I'll get through. Uh, I've, it, it's probably more stress that I'm taking on because of work. There were things that were happening in personal life uh, that were impacting. And as these things added up, COVID, personal stuff, work stuff, Mm. Working from home, always in a room, talking to a screen. Yeah. It built up slowly. So I thought it's just a phase. As soon as the office is open, as soon as we start to meet people, things will take care of themselves. I will get through this. Mm. Wow. And so once that, once you shared it, because I'm trying to remember when you shared it with me, were you in it already? Were you, had you already spoken to the person about burnout? So I think you brought up that word. Uh, yes, I had the first person I talked to was my manager. Okay. Uh, and he was very supportive. He was like, yeah. take time off as much as you want. Right. Uh, relax and come back. Uh, I did talk to you as well. But I just felt that I wanted a sustainable solution. I didn't want one time break and probably hit a burnout sometime in the future again. Mm. So that's the key takeaway I took from that initial phase of discovery and acceptance that I am in a burnout. Wow. I want to come back later to talk about like, so what was that sustainable thing that you did? But I want to hear it skip for you, knowing that, you know, you had this role, you're, you know, (laughs) self-identified tough guy um, and, you know, obviously sharing yourself with your team. What was it like before? I've heard of some of that story, but I don't think Prashant knows. So you might want to give him a little color about what your experience was like. Well, uh, being a tough guy ha- is a double-edged sword <laughs> because it, it helps you get through uh, difficult situations uh, in many cases. But at the same time, it, it's a defense mechanism. And so things were happening in my life. And that mentality, we call in wrestling, we call it gut it out. So as things get harder, you just push harder, you just work harder. You just, you know, the wrestling mat, you know, your lungs are burning, your muscles ache. Well, oh, I'm not giving up. You know, I don't care how much I, I ache there, or you're doing calisthenics. All right, one more push up. <laughs> Run a little bit faster with that rinse sprint. You know, th- this kind of mentality. So when you are struggling with emotional and mental health issues, uh, that mentality is not a good mentality. And so I first began to experience insomnia. Things were going, uh, issues were happening in my department that were going to impact patient care and graduate medical education, the training of our residents and medical students, things that I couldn't have impacted, but I took it on personally. 
And then I began to have these negative thoughts. You're a failure. You let your department down. You let the army down. You let your family down. You're a fake. You don't deserve to be a colonel. And on the heels of that, who's going to want to hire you? Because it was about a year and a half before I was going to retire from the army. Hmm. So that's going on. My insomnia now just compounds itself. So first an hour, two hours, three hours. And I'm getting up, you know, almost every hour on the hour. The nights I can fall asleep within a couple hours. Boom, I'm wide awake and can't get to sleep. And this anxiety, I can feel this flutter in my chest and my hands are tremulous. Then my cognition starts uh, being impacted. I have trouble remembering. What did I just read five minutes before? Huh? What was that? Remembering a name, a name of a, a, a medication or a medical syndrome. So you're talking with a colleague or you're talking to a student or a resident and you're, you're explaining this medication or trying to remember this medical name of this medical syndrome and you're going, uh, 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 uh. And it's like you're running through these files in your brain and you're feeling like an idiot because you know it's there, yeah. but you can't pull it up. So I feared that I had early onset dementia because of this. So the, that, and then my mood is just sinking down into the toilet. And, and it's not just feeling down, discouraged. It's like this heavy, dark, palpable cloud descends upon you that, that now life becomes this walking through life in black and white. The color just gets sucked out of it. And then you lose pleasure in things. So I already talked a little bit there about wrestling mm -hmm. and how that is a passion in my life. I didn't have any desire to be involved with wrestling, coaching the kids I coached, watching wrestling, anything to do with that. Didn't give me any pleasure, you know? So you, you lose the ple pleasure there. I talked about the cognition, these negative thoughts. I, my confidence, gone, in, uh, became indecisive, uh, withdrew. And then like you, physical symptoms, you know, all, you know, from overuse injuries and uh, other injuries that I suffered from wrestling, the osteoarthritis. Now those were exacerbated, you know, I ached more and so forth because of the inflammation that this causes. And of course the insomnia just made all of this worse. Hmm. And, and you add to that just feeling worthless, you know, so this constellation, and it got progressively worse over the months. So it started off with those negative thoughts and the insomnia and the lost confidence and the indecision and, and the anxiety and the paired cognition. And then just all of this just became compounded over time. And by, so that was starting in, in June, July timeframe of 2013, April, 2014, April 17, 2014, I go to work and normal day after getting up after a horrible night's sleep, go to work early. I always got there early and walk into my office and turned on, unlock the office, turned on the lights and step in. And then everything just was crashing down on me. And I locked the door behind me turned off the lights, drew the blinds and turned off my phones and crawled under my desk in a fetal position. And I'm lying there on this musty carpet asking myself, Skip, what are you doing? Skip, how did you get here? And it was becoming like this doctor patient. I'm having this internal dialogue with myself and observing what had happened. And it's like all these flashbacks going on because trauma is a cumulative thing. And so traumatic childhood and traumas from teenage years and adult years and things you deal with as a physician in the army and then this past year of the what stack. had happened. And wow. yeah, exactly, the stacks. And if you don't deal with it, uh, you know, I would tell my patients over the years, if you don't deal with things, it's like having this closed container and eventually it's gonna come out some way because there's gotta be an outlet for it. So you have an input valve and it's a closed container. Well, it's gonna come out. It might come out as a, 
as abdominal pain. It might come out as back pain. It might come out some other way, but it's going to come out yeah. if you don't deal with it. Oh, doctor, take your own advice. <laughs> you know, later I would kind of joke and say, oh, if I'd only been my own doctor. Well, wait a minute. I am a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you bring but, up a, an interesting observation skip first of all thank you so much that was very vivid right and for sean i noticed i noticed you nodding your head so i'm curious what what were you thinking as you were hearing him say that uh, as you said the the story was very vivid you could almost feel going through that as skip was narrating it and uh, i mean i just was trying to envision how would it be to go through that uh, and, and so i just felt very uh, empathetic and in the moment as to what was happening with, with Skip. Ah. You know, both of you describe these, these internal, right, in, internal emotions and, um, but external behaviors, right? Um, so maybe you had a fever, like you said, but then, you know, however that looked when you were in bed, maybe you're getting up and you're, I don't know, taking medicine or whatever. So there's probably something that you were doing to try to combat the fever. And then Skip, you mentioned that too, you know, having um, insomnia. So you're waking up every hour, every couple of hours, your spouse is there and, and you're having, like, why are you getting up? What's going on? So I'm just curious about how did the people around you, while you were in this space, right? <laughs> feeling overwhelmed, depressed, burnt, all that was kind of accumulating. How are the people around you reacting? To the, so yeah, go ahead, Prashant. Uh, so for me, uh, my 11 year old is a good critique. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't say much, but once in a while, when he says it, he makes it a very simple observation. He will just state it as a matter of fact, but there is so much behind it. And there was one day where he was like, I think you have been little more irritable than your usual self. Wow. And I just pay a close attention to him. He doesn't say much uh, hmm. in, in, in those regards, but once he says it it's, it, it's very clear that if he has noticed it, then it's a real problem. And so once he said that, what did you, what, what came through your mind? It, it sort of validated hmm. the internal feeling that I had that uh, uh, I'm not being self-critical. It's a genuine thing mm. that's happening hmm. that others are also noticing. It's not just me making mm -hmm. a mountain of a mole uh, it's it's a real thing yeah interesting i think that's fascinating um <laughs> you know kids right they they not only say the darndest things but they have the keenest observations when yep. they do uh fascinating um and skip what about for you well how are the people around you in your life reacting as you were not before you shared anything right so what what were people doing or saying to you in that time? No, it's it's interesting because up before I shared, really nobody was saying anything because uh, I am a tough guy and I could keep it together pretty much uh, and wasn't sharing things with people, was trying to carry on, but I was withdrawing. So my world became smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, you know, I'd go to work, you know, I'd go to work out, come, come home, you weren't going out, ex wasn't accepting invitations, we'd go to church, I'd come home. Uh, so my world just shrank in terms of contact. Nobody uh, because, said anything? Uh, no one was like, I haven't seen you in a long, none of that, none of it. Huh. Yeah, and so that, now my mom and my brother, Chris, you know, they, they were concerned because they recognized changes. So I shouldn't say that uh, others didn't, and they were, and, and Sherry was noticing things, but it, it was this insidious process. So it wasn't like one day you're like this, and then the next day you're like this. It was, this process was taking place from June uh, timeframe, mid-June to mid-April when I crawl under that desk. Mm. And I'm struggling with these questions to finally come to the point where I can see what's going on. I have insight after four hours of wrestling with this and seeing all this stuff that's been going on. And it's like, boom, skip, you're depressed. Go get help. Yeah. Uh, there. So it was this slow, insidious process. 
And then afterwards, yeah, Sherry could say, oh, yeah, I can see it. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that, Sherry would say, is because the way she viewed me as this very strong, driven, confident person. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, then she could understand, oh, because she could see the insomnia. Because, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, I, I, I lay down, try to get sleep, get back up, lay down, or, you know, wait to go to sleep. I fall asleep and boom, I'm awake. And then I'm up awake for the rest of the night, that type of thing. So she knew the insomnia was a horrible problem. And uh, uh, that really concerned her uh, with that. But others, because I could together. kind of keep it together, at least on the outside, uh, there, there were situations, you know, where my hands, for instance, we'd go to church and I'd be holding the, the hymnal or holding a, a sheet for songs and my hands would be doing this and I'd think, you know, good grief, somebody's going to be asked if my hands are shaking <laughs> or if you always quiver in my voice. Uh, so wow. uh, for the, if the person really is tuned in, see, uh, see they would have seen it. Uh, see, I'm an empath. As I, as you are, uh, Valerie, I know, <laughs> and so I, I read people very well, and that's one of the strengths I have as a physician, and I suspect you are too, there, uh, Prashant, just uh, hearing and listening to you, and, and again, that's a double-edged sword, <laughs> <laughs> because not only do you read people well and feel what they feel, but it gloms onto you, <laughs> yeah, and, and so it kind of sticks to you. Uh, uh, with that and, and so but others don't necessarily pick up on those cues and, and they don't detect that in, in people uh, and so uh, that that's one of the things that that I understand but like I said wow. being that tough guy I could put on that exterior meanwhile I'm just dying on the inside if you will and struggling uh, like I've never struggled in my life before. You know, you know, uh, yeah. Skip, I just wanted to share. So first of all, I, I would thank you both. This is, this is very revealing conversation. So I'm, I'm getting a lot and I realize that uh, I have not necessarily had some of those experiences that you described, but I've been raised by a family of tough guys, <laughs> so to speak, right? Only girl, my dad was in the army for 27 years, you know, <laughs> so three brothers, so there's a lot of testosterone already. My mom was a school teacher. She was pretty no nonsense upbringing. So we weren't suffering fools at home very much, right? If I, I didn't learn to cry until I was an adult. Wow. I'm sure I cried when I was a child, Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was one of those things like, why are you crying? No tears, right? So suck it up, push through whatever you need to do. So that was a lot of the conditioning that I had. And I remember my lifetime, the most, ex the, the biggest experience of sadness was when I divorced, when I got divorced. But I, so I will share that my ex-husband, who, who he and I are now good friends, he was the best teacher for me. He really unlocked some things because he was a complete opposite. He expressed emotion, Argentinian, expressed emotion so easily. Every time, <laughs> I mean, he would play music and I knew his mood. And truth Ooh, be told, sometimes wow. when he would play tango, I knew I was coming home and I heard tango. I knew that he was kind of down. <laughs> Sometimes I'd turn around and go back to my car. Oh, <laughs> I know, I know. I can't, I, I can't deal with this. I'm sorry. Because honey, I, I was so out this. of touch with my own emotions. I had not learned how to cope with strong emotions. And so sometimes being around it, as you mentioned, you know, being an empath of sorts, I could sense it, but I was like, I don't know what to do with them when I see them or experience them. So I would run away, literally and <laughs> figuratively with him. Um, and then when we divorced, which should not be no surprise to you <laughs> based on how I was reacting to some of that, <laughs> um, that was like where I found myself really, really low. And it so happened that my mom was here. It was like around the holiday period, maybe Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, something like that. My mom was visiting. He'd already moved out and everything. And I didn't want to do anything. And a, generally a very active person. My mom and I would go do things. And I was just like, sure. no, no movies. No, I don't want to go to game. No, I don't want to go visit anybody. Mm. Um, all I wanted to do was watch World War II movies <laughs> and the Godfather trilogy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> nothing, nothing dark. No, not at all. <laughs> 
I don't know. Maybe there were some other forces at play. Um, but that's where I found comfort <laughs> is watching people die on screen. <laughs> Terrible, I know, but um, and I know she was very concerned. But my mom just, you know, bless her heart, she didn't really know what to do with me either because we just in our family were not used to dealing with those types of emotions. But anyway, so going back to, to you know, you all obviously, I think as men, there's probably even more pressure. I I can't even imagine what it's like, especially between among men. So, what do you do when you're in the middle of that? Like you know. I have three brothers. I don't know if any of them have experienced burnout. No one's ever said anything to me, but I can imagine, you know, they're professionals, they have families, they have stresses. So how do I know how to have a conversation or how to hold space when all of this stuff is going on for you or for them? As a sister, as a wife, as a, you know, as a mother, like what would it, how would you, how can we as women help our mates or our, our sons or coworkers like that? I can take a crack at this. Um, for me, uh, talking, finding the time and focus to talk to a person has helped. As a, even as a teenager, when, whenever I had a heart to heart conversation with my mom, I opened up a lot more than I ever did with her in, in, in a normal case. Hmm. She was busy with her life, taking care of the family, helping us grow. We were busy with school and other priorities. So the, 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 the hours, the days where we sort of sat together and it, it just so happened that we started talking. Uh, and as I opened up a little bit more, she could figure that out, what was happening. Yeah. The best thing she did was not being judgmental or a problem solver in that, in that very moment yeah. and mm -hmm. let it all come out. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she did that intentionally or it just, it just so happened, but those kind of uh, sessions or, or episodes did help a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, I never checked with her if, if she figured out something about me in those conversations, uh, but I, I think she did. And she then helped in her own ways. Mm. So just giving you space to talk and freely share without trying to fix it, with change it, any of those things. That's yeah. really tough. I know even as a coach, I've had to practice not solving <laughs> problems for people, but especially as a, as a sister. And in my case, then as a spouse, it was like, here's how you deal with it. Here's what you need to do. Like, hey, I feel better. That's such an instinct for us women, I think, to want to make people feel better. Um, that's great advice. Thank you, Prashant. I'm writing it down. Uh, right now. <laughs> uh, go, going back to what you said earlier, the way people have been conditioned, so your household, but uh, in our society, and, and thank goodness, I think this is changing, but, but grew, I grew up hearing the words, don't be a sissy. Mm -hmm. Don't be a crybaby. Men don't cry. Mm -hmm. Suck it up. And, and you grow up hearing this, and there's actually a research done on this. There, there is a uh, psychologist, uh, Ronald Levant, Levant. He's a former president of the American Psychological Association. And he coined this term called normative male alexithymia. Hmm. And normative male alexithymia means uh, feelings without words. So alexithymia means uh, feelings without words that you don't know what you're feeling. And, and so for men, this idea that we suppress our emotions to the point where we do not know what we're feeling. And, and it's not acceptable in many settings for men to express things. So we can express elation. We can express love, at least in, in certain fashions. And we can express anger and aggression mm. but to express uh this idea that i'm sad i'm disappointed i'm hurt i'm confused uh to to express some of these 
uh, e emotions that might be considered on the negative uh, spectrum that I, I, idea that, uh, oh man, you know, that, that, that irritates me or uh, that, that idea of, I don't know what to do here. I'm really struggling in, 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 in a way is emasculating many men feel. Mm -hmm. It's the idea I'm less than a man. I, there must be a defect in me. And so we haven't given space to men to realize, no, that's not being less than a man. That's merely being human. Mm -hmm. and, and so th there's that fallacy. And of course, the, the media doesn't help that really, because what do we see as the tough guys, you know, the, these kind of tough guys, they're the go getting, I'm tough, you know, and mm -hmm. bam, bam, you know, I can take this pain and I don't need anybody and boy, I can solve this problem. That, that's the type of person that we see on the glossy screen and that's portrayed. And so, yeah, we like to see our heroes and we like to see that they can get out of these tough uh, things and so forth. But I talk about this idea that uh, masculinity has these, these two sides to it. There's this tough protector provider mm -hmm. side that you, be, you better not mess with my family. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, don't, don't even go there, you know, that yes. And, and you don't do that in an ugly fashion or a hateful fashion, but, but you do that in a firm uh, and if need be aggressive fashion, if it's life threatening or whatever, but then there's this soft, tender, kind a side of you that can shed tears openly, that can show affection openly. And uh, that side that can say, yeah, I'm hurting. Yes, I'm confused. Yes, I'm disappointed. Yes, I'm confused. Yeah, I'm just not sure here what's going on mm. that, that you can say, yeah, I'm fearful, but guess what? We're going to deal with this. You know, that you can say those things openly, but say, that's okay, mm. but we're going to deal with this. So there, there's these two sides to masculinity. And for too long, men have only been allowed to express this part. And because of that, we've lost contact with that other side of us to our detriment. And that's part of what I was battling until I could, I could uh, uh, that idea, oh, okay, I don't need to be this tough guy. Yeah, I am a tough guy, but that, that doesn't mean that I can't express the full gamut and I can't openly share those things. But that's, I think, part of the dilemma. I see Prashant over here nodding in agreement because he's been there and the societies we've grown up in and, you know, you know the things we've been told and what we see among men. I but, wonder, but I wonder, Skip, I mean, and, and Prashant, you can answer this too. Like how much of this is also cultural? Because like I said, my ex-husband, Argentinian, he was far more expressive emotionally. And, and truth be told, like I told you, he, he was a great teacher for me. He actually normalized strong emotions. And, you know, years later after we, I, I definitely had a therapist help me through the course. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not watching World War II movies and The Godfather every weekend, <laughs> only on holidays now. <laughs> but he helped normalize these big emotions for me and gave them words. Um, and now as friends, whenever we do have a conversation, you know, he's given me so much space to now name mm -hmm. those things. And ironically, you know, the, the other relationships I've had the men have always been much more expressive than I have. Mm. So I'm curious about the role that culture plays here. Oh yeah. Oh, Prashant, yeah. what would you say to that? Yeah, culture definitely does. I do come from a culture which is more patriarchal. So the men do play the head of the household. One more idea I do want to throw in the pool is, I think people who are playing the leadership role uh, or responsible person role, whether uh, it's a man or a woman, I think that kind of responsibility creates this pressure to bottle up your emotions mm -hmm. and not express it. Yeah. Because if you are vulnerable, if you are so quote unquote weak, mm -hmm. then others will start to lose trust in you or others will, will not feel good about themselves being led by you. Mm -hmm. 
I feel, I mean, even in the, in the families that I have seen where women are the head of the household, they end up mimicking this behavior of not yeah, being yeah. very emotive mm. and not expressing themselves and bottling that up. Yeah. I don't know, Skip, how, how do you feel about uh, that point of view? I, I, I would agree that uh, it, there's cultural differences, no, no doubt about it. And, and so certain segments of the Hispanic culture can be very expressive, but others, there's that machismo. Mm. And, and see, I moved through, if you will, in different cultures. There, there was a wrestling culture. There's the, the Hispanic culture I moved in. There's the army culture I moved in. Uh, mm. the, the medical culture I moved in. So there, there's different cultures, if you will, that I navigated, the leadership culture. And, and then there's the familial culture. And so you brought up that role of leadership. See, uh, and, the, and then you look at the roles we play in, in our families and in others there. I've always been a caregiver. See, from the time I was a mm. young child, I have been a caregiver. I was in charge of my four younger brothers as far as I can remember. And even as we got older, I was one of the caregivers in my family and I'm still one of the caregivers in my family. That's just one of the roles. So I've, I've always played that role as a caregiver uh, throughout my life. And, and so these roles we take on, and I think that was perhaps part of it is uh, you talked about it, that idea of uh, denying your own needs, your own self-care. Well, I'm a prime example of that. Mm. And that certainly was one of the big contributors to what happened to me uh, uh, with that. So it, it, it's not just a few things that lead to burnout. It's not just a few things that lead to depression. It's multifactorial, uh, generally speaking. Uh, you know, in my case, it was accumulated trauma over many years, and then this perfect storm of what occurred yeah. uh, there uh, going on those months uh, there leading up to that event where me, I crawled under that desk. Oof. Well, gentlemen, I think it's time for a wild card question. So I ask my guests to come up with their own questions too. So I think this is, I mean, these conversations, I'm sure inspiring some curiosity and um, I'd like to hear what would you ask your your co-guest who would like to share i can ask uh, okay. the question skip skip <laughs> what were the key turning points in your life the top one or two uh, mm -hmm. that completely sort of changed uh, your life in a big way thank you for that question i think what uh, key turning points in my life one was when my mother remarried so as I talked about, I alluded to a very traumatic childhood, uh, the third of eight children. My father came back mentally ill from the Korean War and uh, was really spent most of his time in and out of uh, Veterans Administration's hospitals being treated. So it wasn't really a part of our life during that time. And so grew up basically fatherless. My mother remarried a wonderful man. I call my daddy, Edward L. Lubin when uh, I was 12 and a half years old. So he really became the father I knew and brought stability into our lives and showed me what uh, a man, a loving man could be and a loving father and husband. So that, that was the first turning point. The next turning point would have been uh, at 16 years old when I had an encounter with God and committed my life to Jesus Christ. That would have been the second turning point. I, I think the third turning point would, would have been uh, marrying my sweetheart, Sherry. Uh, I was 25 years old. Sherry was 23 when we married. And this past May, we celebrated 40 years of, of marriage. So those are three pivotal. And then as I talked about the depression I suffered in 20, 2014, that uh, that changed the course of my life because it gave me a calling mm -hmm. to help other men with this dark disease. So it, it's 
uh, some pivotal points, and there are certainly others as we can all point, point to, but those are pivotal points that I can look at. Mm. Like your, your mess is your message. That's what I've heard. Indeed, yeah. indeed. And right. Prashant, I, I would like to ask you in terms of your upbringing. So I, I believe you're from India. Yeah. And so grew up in an Indian household. And so what was that change like? So you grew up in that Indian culture there, now immigrating to the, to the US and having to enculturate a, a, into the US. Tell us about that. Sure, so it so happens that at this stage, half of my life was in India and half of my life has been in US. Uh, the, the most impressionable thing that I remember I, was probably the first or the second day in US. I, I flew from Mumbai, that's where I grew up. I started at Michigan State, uh, go green. Uh, <laughs> the Trojans, rip. yeah. Hey, 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 wait, 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 me too, me too. Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, continue. <laughs> so I uh, came here for a, a grad program uh, in computer science. I went in into an orientation for teaching assistant uh, role. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the first time I'm stepping out of country. Uh, my English is whatever it is or whatever it was, not mm -hmm. the first language. But the, the warmth, the the risk, the, the training, the support uh, that I got from people whom I have never met in my life, mm. who helped me be successful, mm. uh, getting resituated in a new culture, uh, understanding what's good, what's bad. Mm. My uh, professor uh, who had us over for Thanksgiving dinner mm. and, and sort of getting more familiar with those uh, with the culture, all those little, little, little things mm -hmm. have played a huge role in me getting comfortable uh, with the with the cultural change. Mm. There are certain personality traits that worked well in the in the culture in the sense that uh, in India the culture is a lot more social. Everyone mm. spends a lot more time uh, building relationship and so on. Uh, I'm a little bit more of an introvert. Mm. Uh, so almost like every phase of the life, I have one person whom I'm deeply connected to, but I do not have 10, 15, 20 friends type deal. Mm. The culture here enabled me to be myself, uh, to, to mm. connect people uh, at the pace I wanted, in a level that I wanted. And, and I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to call myself now. Whether I'm an Indian American or an American Indian, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm both. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, That's thank cool. You. Oh, wonderful. Well, and indeed, go green to have given you that experience, right? To to kind of shepherd you into a new culture and do it with such grace and warmth and welcome, and yeah, you know, that I think that's that's wonderful place to kick things off when you're wanting to build a life is to come someplace to go someplace that's that's that inclusive right mm -hmm. that's that's fantastic all right what's the next question another wild card skip if you were to change one or two things in your life what would uh, those be if I were to change one or two things in my life, what would that be? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's see. I would be a uh, six foot, 180, <laughs> 190 pounds, you know, <laughs> this good looking guy that would walk into a room and command it by my presence. Uh, <laughs> you should. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. You should give him a frame of reference. Why you said six foot? Uh, I, I'm five foot five, about 130 pounds. <laughs> so you can see <laughs> why that's a big deal. Okay, <laughs> literally a big deal. Uh, uh, you know that's that's a great question because uh, what would you change? Because I think all of our life experiences uh, shape us. So it's easy to look back in retrospect and say change this, change that. And I think we all have regrets in our life and 
things we say, well, if I had to do it over, I would do this uh, differently. Um, but those things uh, shape us and we can't live in would have, could have, should have. But I guess the advice that I would give and I tell parents is don't miss the time with your kids because those days are fleeting. Don't miss it. I, I talk about the days when I had five kids that were swirling around my ankles and we'd have this herd of five and they'd go places and do things and, and enjoy our time together. And then as they got to be teens, it's like, eh, dad. And so some of them didn't want to do things with you and, and so forth. And then as they began to leave the house, boom, boom, boom. And then they were gone. And it's like, wow, that was fast. Mm -hmm. Although some of those years with the teenagers, when they were very trying, it's like, oh, you know, it seemed like an ordeal, but, but still, when you look back, it's like, wow, you know, it just seemed like they were swirling around my ankles, you know, this little tribe that, that was there and we'd go out and play and do things and they'd climb on my back and we'd wrestle and I'd be out in the front yard and we'd be playing foosball and yeah, going to the theme park and having a ball, going down the slides or the roller coaster together. Uh, but those days are so fleeting. And so it breaks my heart when I see, uh, when I see parents with young children and they're at a park or they're someplace and the kids are playing and what do the parents do? <laughs> and the kids trying to get their attention parents doing this or they're at a sporting event or some other event and what the parents do mm. oh my gosh you, you just want to go and say wake up wake up wake up that child is only going to be that age once that child is going to grow so quickly don't miss it don't miss it mm. and so that's uh, one thing uh, if if, you could, if I could go back, I think it would just be to spend more time listening. Oh, just, just listening, you know, keeping your mouth shut when the kids would say something, not, not reacting, just, hmm, well, that's interesting. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> Rather than, are you kidding me? What? <laughs> just, hmm. Really? He's just taking time to listen. Mm -hmm. And I do talk about that way, not being judgmental. Or I think Prashant, maybe you mentioned it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Listening. Because if you can listen, kids will tell you things when when you can listen. And I, I think because you give them a safe space and then kids will test you and they'll bring up something and they'll test the waters. Mm -hmm. How are you gonna react? And if they don't get a reaction out of you with this, it's like, okay, I think the water's safe. I'm going a little deeper. <laughs> Mm. But if they get a lot rise out of you when they raise something, guess what? <laughs> they're, they're, they're not going to go uh, any farther with that. Yeah. So that, that's, I, 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 that would be one thing. Yes. <laughs> I, I would zip this and try not to overreact. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. You know, it's just like, <laughs> really? That's really yeah. interesting. You know? You know, it's funny. Me. My dad's Tell me a little bit more about that. You see, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's taken a long time to get here. So yes, those years are fleeting, and it does. You know, I think to your point, Skid, that's really important to hear, especially about the parent-child relationship, because I saw it in our family. We didn't. My mom was very talkative. My dad was not, and now you know they're both talking. <laughs> but um, but he's also more curious and. But, it, you know, for me, as the only girl, I think I always had kind of a special space and, and I, I tend to do what I do everywhere in my life. So I talk and I ask questions a lot. But I know with my brothers, that lack of relationship, I think, has had a bigger toll. So it's taking mm. them a lot longer. So if you think you can do a redo, you know, 30 years later and hope to have some closeness, it's going to take a minute. Um, and for, for my dad, I noticed that with my brother's taken a little longer for there to be that same level yeah. of connection that could have been there when there were kids um yeah. we have okay so i think skip one last question for prashant 
One last question for Prasad. Well, th this is uh, along that line. So I, I see that you are an inventor. Six patents, what I saw. And, oh, you did your research. Dick. And so what one of those had to do with <laughs> had to do with pre-registration for uh, patient pre-registration. So uh, with that, that intrigued me because I've done some of those pre-registrations and I've had patients who have done pre-registrations. And uh, what advice would you give for that individual who says, I want to be an inventor? I think that's the most, inventing is the most fulfilling thing. It's, it's easy to follow direction. It's easy to copy what someone else has done. Mm. Uh, it's just, it just takes your satisfaction level to a next level uh, or satisfaction to the next level when you contribute something new and unique. Hopefully the impact is broad and deep, but even if the impact is narrow and deep or wide or, and shallow, it's still an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, we all build on each other's work. So whatever mm -hmm. new work that we are putting forward, hopefully someone else builds on top of it and takes it forward. Uh, so th 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 those are the two things, very fulfilling and satisfying. And then it just helps keep moving the ball forward. Got a little you. treasure chest, Prashant. There's like more little <laughs> treats in there, so I can't yeah, wait to yeah. hear more. Yeah, yeah, this man, I was I was struck by the fact of his uh, this idea of working with individuals related to burnout and sharing that story, but then this very technical side uh, of all the things he's done on the technical side, his extensive history with uh, Microsoft and now the things he does in Salesforce in terms of data protection and then the 3D printing and all this other stuff. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this guy's a techno wizard. You know? <laughs> Prashant, did your research that. skip before this? I tried not to, just to uh, be very curious about what I learned. Uh, so I intentionally didn't go... The only thing I did is I Googled him and there is lot, lots of hits for him. <laughs> All positive, I'm sure. Yes, uh, <laughs> positive. no mug shots or anything like that. <laughs> Absolutely, there's no mug shots. <laughs> no mug shots. <laughs> oh, wow. So I'm curious now that the two of you have met. Obviously, Skip, you had you did your, your deep dive. Prashant, you were like, nope, let me just discover. I'm curious after this interaction, what are you taking away from this conversation with each other? Wow. Hmm. So if I had just met Skip without him telling him his journey, mm. I wouldn't have guessed mm. uh, that what has gone with his life uh, in his mind, a physical injury, a physical uh, a visual thing is easy for everyone to understand and notice. Uh, the invisible side of things can only be found by talking. So I'm, I'm really, really glad that I got to know Skip and learn about his story. Uh, but it, would have been, it wouldn't have been possible, Valerie, without you setting up this connection. So thanks for that. Oh, I'm so grateful. Cool. So true. Thank you, Prashant. Skip, what about you? What are you taking away? I'm taking away... Uh another uh, friend here that that's what I'm taking away that, that there's things with this man's heart mm -hmm. that uh, are similar to my heart uh, uh, and so I found a new friend that, that that's what I'm taking away from this uh, Prashant I look forward to deepening our relationship and a continued uh, relationship and developing a friendship with you uh, there that uh, there there's things that that uh, beat between our heart that, that our hearts are in sync. And so I, I, I look forward to getting to know you better and hopefully sometime meeting you in person and, and getting to have that eye to eye uh, time together. I look forward to that as well, Skip. Thanks for that. Cool. Prashant, are you sure you have space for one more person in your circle? <laughs> are you, are we opening up here? Like, what are we doing? What's this? <laughs> it's one per quarter. One per quarter. <laughs> All right, you save one of those quarters for me, buddy. <laughs> you made the cut. I'm glad we got him in in January. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> cool. 
Um, and, and then any final words, especially because the topic we touched on is so, is so prevalent nowadays. You know, you know, Prashant, you alluded to the pandemic also being a big part of what was stacking up, right? That's part of the, of the trauma, like Skip mentioned, of what's happening in the world, the relationships mm -hmm. being altered, the way we work being altered, our bodies and our, our awareness of our bodies being altered too. What, if you had to challenge people who've been listening or, or observing this podcast with something that would support either themselves or the people they care for, what, what challenge would you give them? I would throw out a challenge for people to talk to the people whom they trust and share what's going on in their life regularly. Even if they feel they're not close to burnout or a depression, just get in the habit of doing that. Hmm. Talking, sharing feelings, uh, finding a sounding board will go a long way in helping with the, the mental strength uh, that, that you have. Hmm. Excellent. Skip, what would you add to that? If you're struggling out there, don't suffer in silence one more day. Go get help. Mm. And uh, Valerie, may I leave a prescription for your viewers, your listeners? Yeah. And I have given this prescription to thousands and thousands of my patients. It's, and I tell my patients, See, this medication has no bad side effects. It has no drug to drug interactions. You cannot overdose on it. Proverbs 17, 22 says, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine, mm. but a broken spirit can dry up the bones. So I tell my patients, and as I said, I've written this prescription thousands of times laugh and laugh heartily each and every day it's good medicine laugh and laugh harder each and every day heartily hardly heartily got it lovely wow i mean i couldn't end on a better note than that and I think we've shared some laughs here too. Indeed. I think mostly at my expense, but that's okay. <laughs> that's why I'm here. I am so grateful to the two of you for one, telling, first, just saying hi, just saying hi and coming on this show and, and, and being mm. a part of it, saying yes, not hi. You said hi, but yes, you said yes. <laughs> and then also how, how openly and generously you shared your struggles, your, your insights, your discoveries, your challenges, your, your wins, your resources with all of us. So grateful for the two of you for that. And number three, just how warm and, and fun loving and friendly the two of you have been not only towards me personally, but also towards a complete stranger mm -hmm. in a public setting. Look at that. <laughs> So excited for the two of you in this new friendship that's budding and, you know, Prashant expanding his circle by one more. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will make sure that the resources that you all recommend, the two of you recommend that people reach, look into to support them if they're experiencing burnout or depression or someone in their lives experiencing that. I'll make sure I add that to the show notes. So thank you the, to the two of you once again for being here and sharing your message with all of us. Thank you, Valerie. It's Thanks, been my Valerie. pleasure. Absolutely. And for those of you who are tuning in, please let us know in the comments or rate us or put a nice little favorite heart so that we yes. don't, you don't miss a single episode, but let us know what resonated for you. Mm -hmm. I'd love for, for these two gentlemen to see that other people were listening and that mm -hmm. you're taking something away from this conversation. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. Bye. You've been listening to the podcast, Not Quite Strangers. Be sure to subscribe or follow on your favorite video or podcast platform. And for more information and content, go to notquitestrangers.com. See you next time.